I love the book of James. It was a, an early love for me, if you will, uh, shortly after I surrendered to preach. Probably the first book of the Bible that really grabbed my attention, grabbed my heart, and something I was very interested in and, and began to study deeply was this book of James. And um, my, my desire is to preach through the book of James and uh, to do that during this Sunday school hour. Um, I was debating on doing this during another service time, um, but felt like the Lord led me today to go ahead and start with this, uh, the book of James. Uh, if you read the entirety of the book of James, you'll find out uh, he, he's kind of, uh, you might would say he's, he's ADD, he's just all over the place. It's, uh, it, it's these, these series of very practical topics that are dealt with uh, in the book. That's why it's actually been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's very practical. It's very, it's not very deep, if you will. There's not a lot of deep doctrinal points that are made. Uh, certainly there's doctrine in the book, but the emphasis of the book is living for Jesus, being a mature Christian. It is, it's spiritual maturity. That, that's the theme uh, of the book. He goes on to deal with a list of subjects. He begins with dealing with trials in our life. Uh, he, he, he deals with temptation to sin. He deals with people claiming to believe something but not living it out. Uh, he deals with having respect of persons, treating some people better than others for various reasons. Uh, he deals with uh, your tongue uh, in, in chapter 3, the things that you say, the words that we use, and how uh, important that it is that we have a a spiritual maturity when it comes to our speech. Uh, it deals with worldliness. I mean, it just goes on and on dealing with these different topics uh, that all have to do with the underlying theme of spiritual maturity. So it deals with practical wisdom, and uh, that, that's, I guess, the, uh, in a nutshell, the theme of the book of James is spiritual maturity, and uh, I'm excited to get into it. Uh, probably because I, I, I need some spiritual maturity. I mean, I need to grow. Uh, and, and I don't care where you are in your Christian walk. This is encouraging, uh, and it also can be a little convicting, but there's room above you wherever you're at. If you got saved yesterday, as we would expect, there's room above you, right? There's, there's some higher ground that you could gain spiritually. Uh, or if you've been saved for 40 years, there's room above you. Uh, and, and so my, my prayer, my desire in, in studying and preaching through this book, I know in, on, on Wednesday nights we've been dealing with some, some very heavy doctrinal stuff, uh, preaching through Galatians 2.20 some, been doing a few other things that are really heavy in doctrine. And my, my prayer is going through this book, it's going to be just extremely practical. Like this is how we should live. Advice for daily life, uh, if you will. So that's going to be more the tone that we're going to be uh, striking and, and dealing with as we move through this book. And so uh, if you, I'm, I'm probably going to work on, I, I don't have it today, I'm probably going to work on a PowerPoint that goes through and has just my skeleton outline so you all know what I'm talking about, what point we're dealing with. I don't have that today, but, um, but, but essentially we've dealt with the theme of the book. We've introduced it, the theme. Uh, let's talk about the date of the book of Hebrew, or the book of James. The book of James was written. James was martyred. Tradition tells us around 62 A.D. Um, and so, obviously, it's got to be prior to that. Uh, we're not exactly sure on the exact date, but most believe, based on the content of the book as well as his premature death, that this very well could have been the first book written chronologically of the New Testament. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's probably between this and 1 Thessalonians. But this is going to be one of the earliest books that were written, and that's why he doesn't dig deep into a lot of doctrinal points. Uh, he, he, he doesn't delve, you know, dive into the minds of, of, of spiritual insight and all these things. And it's because he is writing to an infant church. Keep that in mind. Think about this. Everybody, everybody in this time period is a baby Christian. You and I have never experienced that. We came along, there were mature Christians in our life, 
there were immature Christians in our life. There was a, a spectrum, a range of spiritual maturity. But in a time like this, when the church is just now getting started, if you're saved, you're a baby Christian. Uh, you, 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 the, the gospel hadn't been around as long. There's, it, there's not been a lot of time for, for people to develop and grow. So what James is doing is, is he's writing to baby Christians. And because of that, he deals with elementary truths. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's what we all should do, right? What we all should do. I have a three-year-old daughter back there, Maddie. I'm not buying Maddie a big T-bone steak. She'll just look at it, right? She just, she just, she just look at it. There's nothing she can do with it. She, there's nothing she can do. And if she tried to digest that, she'd probably choke, right? If she tried to eat it, if she tried, if I tried to force her to, to eat something that's above what she can handle, right? Well, uh, well, that's how it is spiritually. That's how it is spiritually. Uh, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 2. He said, I have fed you with meat, with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So he says, I'm having to feed you milk because you can't handle the meat. Now that was given, in, in a sense, a rebuke because they should have been able to handle meat. And, and you read the context of 1 Corinthians, there's all these sin in their life that is... That is, if you will, it's slowing their spiritual growth. They can't grow as quickly as they should because they're dealing with all these sins in their life. And so he has to deal with them when it comes to, to milk. He's giving them very simple things to understand. It's, it's softball stuff. Amen? Softball stuff. And that's essential the book of James is. But that kind of convicts me because, you know what, I've missed on a lot of those softballs. A, a lot of that simple stuff that it's not deep, it's not... You know, they're not writing doctrinal theses about it. It's something we all understand, and yet understanding it doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, enough for us to, to do it because we do understand it, right? There's so many things that we know that we're supposed to do, and yet we find ourselves not doing those things. That's what I'm driving at. And so he, he is writing to these, uh, these individuals, and, and I've titled the book this, how a mature Christian handles life. How a mature Christian handles life. And, and we uh, are going to see that as we, as we move through this book. This book was written 2,000 years ago, needed 2,000 years ago, and it is desperately needed today. Amen? It's not outdated. It's, and, th and that lets me know that it's God's book. It's God's book. Only God could write a book 2,000 years ago, produce a book 2,000 years ago, and it's... And it's absolutely applicable and relevant to all of us today. We're going to talk about the author. Let's look in verse number 1. Verse number 1. So our first point here, dealing with the author. It's important when you're studying any epistle to know who it is that is writing this epistle, to have an understanding of the context. Verse number 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad Greeting. Obviously, he introduces himself as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit in this introduction uh, gives enough authority, I believe, for James to write and for those who are reading it to find it authoritative. He, he, he gives himself this title of a servant of Christ. Imagine you're writing a letter to a group of people that do not know you. And you are going to try to compel them in your introduction that what you have to say is worth being heard and obeyed. You would lead with your highest accolade, would you not? You, you, would, you would find the greatest title that could accurately describe you and you would use that so that they would say, hey, this is somebody important. This is somebody that we need to listen to. This is someone with something to say. And he leads by calling himself. And not only does he lead with this, this is all he says. James, a servant of Jesus Christ. I am a servant. So he's a servant of Christ. I want to say something about a, the servant's description or what a servant is. What does it mean to be a servant of Christ. A servant is a person that attends 
another, uh, another for the purpose of performing menial offices for him, or who is employed by another for such offices or for other labor and is subject to his command. You are a subordinate if you're a, a, a servant. You're not making any orders. You're not calling any shots. <laughs> Whatever you tell me to do, that's what I have to do because I am a, a servant. I don't have a will of my own. And James is leading with that as, hey, here's why you should listen to what I have to say. Because I am a servant of Jesus Christ. You see what he's doing? He is vesting all of his authority and all of the weight of what he's about to say on the name of Jesus Christ. Not his own name. I think it would be good for all of us to get a little bit of that, just a little dose of that. If we could somehow you know, bottle that up and sell that to where people would stop trying to promote themselves, stop trying to push themselves, and simply confess that they don't have a will of their own. They are obeying the will of Jesus Christ. They're a servant. And he is proud to, to announce that he is a servant. And now today, to be a servant is not a good thing. We think of it as a lowly thing. That's, that's a lackluster title. You're not going to put that on your, on your name tag. You would find, you'd find something better than that. You'd find the best thing you have. You know what a lot, I, I would do? I'd put on there, hey, hey, pastor. Get your nose in the air. Right? Pa- I'm a, I, hey, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. And, and put that on. James was an apostle. <laughs> he he, he could have led with something better than that, Right? But, but what we see is that the people that he's writing to are going to be impressed with a servant. You and I should stop being impressed with people who try to promote themselves. We should be impressed with somebody who is humble and somebody who is a servant and who is willing not only uh, to, 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 to lead from behind, if you will, but somebody who's willing to get out there and to work and to serve and to labor for the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the kind of people who I believe deserve some respect and deserve some honor. And we see that all throughout the book of James. James is going to go on to say in chapter 4, turn to chapter 4. I, I think we're getting, in, in even just the first two words of this book, we, 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 we see him as essentially an illustration of what he's going to say in James chapter 4 and verse number 6. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Look at verse number 10. He says, Humble yourselves therefore in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's a good application that we can draw from this, right? That he's calling himself a servant. He goes on later to say, If you want to be elevated, you need to humble yourself. You need to let God raise you up, not try to manipulate situations, not try to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, position yourself well so that people think well of you. That, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to humble ourselves, confess ourselves a servant. God, we do your bidding. You command us, and we obey. And when you present yourself that way, that is how you gain respect. Now, maybe not in the eyes of this world, but for those that love God, those who are spiritual, those who are saved, you know that you respect people who are servants. And for somebody that's unwilling to roll their sleeves up, and they're unwilling to, to have any sweat on their brow, they're unwilling to, to put their hand to do something and to serve somebody else, you look at that person and you think, well, they just, they just care about themselves. They're selfish. They're, they're, they're prideful. They're arrogant. And this is a wonderful truth, a wonderful application for a bunch of baby Christians and a bunch of grown-up Christians, if you will. I don't care how long you've been saved, you need that truth. And I don't care how long you've been saved, there's room above you when it comes to that truth. There's, there's, gain that, there's ground that we could gain when it comes to humility. So that is the, the servant's description. Let's look, secondly, at the servant's company. So James confesses himself a servant. Who else wears this name tag? That's what I want you to think about. Okay, in what company is James if James is a servant of Christ? 
I'm not going to make you turn to these passages of Scripture, but if you want to write down these, these notes, I'm going to list off just a few people who, who, who bear the same title as James does. So, so by that, we're going to be able to rank, order, if you will, what does it mean to be a servant of Christ. John the Revelator, John the Beloved, begins the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse number 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. John does the exact same thing. Puts his best foot forward. I'm a servant of Christ. That, that, that's my highest accolade. Paul the Apostle. Romans chapter 1. Verse number 1. Says Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus. Uh, uh, excuse me. Paul, a servant of God. Simon Peter. 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter. A servant. Jude. Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. Do you see this? Peter, Paul, Jude, John. All of these that you and I would look at and say they are, that's the top of the line. Don't get any better than that. You know, Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved. John and Peter both saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, shining in his glory. Jude, I mean, you just you go through the list of these men and you think, this is the cream of the crop. This is as good as it gets. You know how they got there? Do you know how they, how, they, uh, how they were viewed in that light and why they are viewed in that light? Because the way they presented themselves were as servants. In each of these books, they begin with that. They lead with that. I've often heard this quoted, and I've found it to be true, that everybody wants to be a servant until you get treated like one. You ever been treated like one? <laughs> it's easy to come to church and say, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, until somebody, you go out these doors, and somebody treats you like a servant, gives you no respect, looks down on you, belittles you, commands you, demands from you. And we don't like that. Amen. We all I'm, I'm just saying we all need to grow in this area, right? Most people today, I have this in my notes, most people today despise the thought of being what made these men great. Again, we're talking about a servant, being a servant. Most people despise the thought of that. A few verses here, we'll move on. Uh, Psalm 2, if you want to turn there, you want to turn to Psalm 2. <clears throat> I just want to look at a couple of verses here. <clears throat> Psalm 2, verse number 11. We get instruction often from the Psalms as in how to serve the Lord, how to be a servant, and we find a motivation of, of service in, in this verse. Psalm 2, verse number 11, he says, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. You serve the Lord with fear. Fear of what? The Lord. It's fearing the Lord. And again, I told y'all that this, this book of James is often called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And we could spend all day in the book of Proverbs when it comes to this idea and this concept of fearing God. Having a fear of the Lord. And I tell you what, if there's anything that is lacking in the church of today, it is the fear of the Lord. Actually fearing God. And that whole concept, we, people have tried to sweep that under the rug to make it mean something else. Say, fear God, well that just that doesn't mean to be afraid of Him. 
that just means to have a reverence for him. That's what some people say. I, I don't believe that. I think it does. You should have a reverence for him. And that, that could certainly be an application or something you draw out of that. But God is to be feared. Amen? He's to be feared. Be, to be afraid of. Just like, just like we, we always draw these illustrations of our fathers. God, I believe, gives us earthly fathers to be an example to us as to how we should relate to and think about our heavenly father. And I'll tell you right now, I was afraid of my dad. There was fear. There was a healthy, respe a respectful fear. Because I know what he could do if he had a mind to. Right? And so what did I do? I tried to spend my time making sure he didn't have a mind to. You tried to conduct myself, especially when he's around, conduct myself in such a way that, that I, I don't want him to have a mind to. I don't want it to cross his mind to deal with me in the ways that he could. Thankfully, my daddy was not everywhere. Right? Your daddy was not everywhere. He couldn't always be around. And that's how you end up getting into trouble, right? You find that distance from the fear. Like the fear of God is over there, or the fear of your father, we'll say. The fear of your earthly father is as far as your father can see. And so you're, I'm going to get outside of where my father is, that way I can do what I want to do. You know what we have in the church? We have people in the church that think that the, the, the realm of the father, the realm of God is at church. As if when you walk in the doors of church, that's the only time God can see you. Oh, you're there. You're in church. That's good. And then you behave on your best behavior, and you're looking up, and I hope he did he see that. Or, okay, and you you know, and you, you go through the motions of a service, and you try to be on your best behavior because your father's watching. And then you go outside, and, and it's like he's got God's got blinders on, or he's asleep, or he can't see. And then you get out here, and then now I can live however I want to just like we did when we were kids. Get away from Daddy, and I can do whatever I want, and then I don't have to be afraid of him because he can't see me. Listen, God sees everything. We have a Father who, unlike our earthly Father, our Heavenly Father can see everything. He sees every move you make, every word that you say, every action that you commit, every, every sin that you commit. He sees all of that. And if we had a healthy dose of the fear of God, it would cause us to live for Him in a better way. It would cause us to be better servants. Y'all see that in Psalm 211? Serve the Lord with fear. Apart from the fear of the Lord, you're going to have a hard time serving God. Because it's not always easy. It's not. Listen, I know that it may have seemed difficult to get up this morning and, and to, to hit the alarm, and to get ready, and to get dressed, and come to church. But that wasn't hard. Everybody okay? That's not that hard. I, mean, I don't know if we expect God to be impressed or something, but it, it's, it's really not that hard. That, there, there are times in your life where it's actually going to be difficult to serve God. Like it might actually cost you something. There might, even, there might actually be a price that you have to pay to serve God. What will motivate you? What will help you to be a consistent servant of God on those days? The fear of the Lord. Having a healthy, I'm not talking about flagellation, right? That's when those people you think about, like, the, especially the Catholics will do this kind of stuff where they'll, they'll, they'll literally beat themselves, whip themselves, right? I believe there's, I think it's down in, the, it might be in the Philippines where there's, they, they literally physically crucify People every year in, 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 a, in a memorial, in a way to punish ourselves and to deal. That, that's not what I'm talking about. We, we have a good heavenly father, amen, who chastises us and who deals with us according to our sin. Brother Jonathan Bach preached on that a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Y'all y'all remember on uh, a few Sunday nights ago, Brother Jonathan Bach was here and he preached through Hebrews 12 and he talked all about that, how the father deals with the children and chastisement and all these things, conviction. And, and that's how our Father works. But we need to serve the Lord with fear. Amen? Now take your Bible and turn to Psalm 100. I want us to see these two verses in connection one to another. Let 
We're dealing with James, a servant, a servant of God. <clears throat> right, is everybody with me so far on everything we've said about serving the Lord with fear? Everybody see right, look in Psalm 100, verse number 2. He says, serve the Lord with what? Gladness. Come before his presence with singing. See, it's not all that bad. So serving God is not strictly about fear. It is about fear. It's about the fear of the Lord. But, but that's not all that ha we have to... We shouldn't serve the Lord with a frown on our face, afraid that he's going to reach out over the banisters of heaven and squish you like a bug. That's not... That's not ser Serving God is having a healthy respect of who God is and what His punishments are and what His chastisement could be in your life. And it is also serving Him with gladness. I'm not sad that I'm saved. I'm not sad that I'm a servant of Christ. People have this idea of service as if it's this great imposition on you. Like it's this, this heavy weight and burden. Like it's something grievous to be born. That, that's not the case. What did Jesus say? He said, come unto me, right? Ye that are heavy or, or, uh, or weary and heavy, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Listen, the, 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 he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What Jesus wants to do is he wants to serve himself through us and with us. Right? So we're fearing God, and that, that, that causes us to serve Him. But that's not all that it is. It's not a drudgery. I'm glad that I'm in church this morning. Y'all get what I'm trying to get at? We serve the Lord with fear, but we also serve the Lord with gladness. I'm happy about it. I'm happy about it. And I'm not going to apologize for being happy about it. There's this... I don't even know what it is. There's this group or there's this mentality in some of our churches that, well, if, if your church, if, if your people shout and your people say amen, that's Baptocostal and that's some kind of craziness. And, well, that, I don't, I'm not for that. Listen, I don't want to be a part of a dead, dry church. I don't want to be a dead, dry Christian. I want to serve the Lord with gladness. And if you need a positive and negative motivation to serve the Lord, we've just seen it. Serve the Lord with fear and with gladness. Listen, the life that you're living, the life of a servant of Christ is better. You understand that? It's better. And I think that the difficulty of a lot of people, especially a lot of church people who were saved young, is that they didn't go out and, and maybe sow their wild oats or whatever, or they didn't spend a bunch of years serving sin in the same way that somebody else has. And then maybe they don't have anything to compare it to. That's why it's probably good for some folks who got maybe saved later in life, maybe to share that testimony. Let some people know, look, the, the world may look fun, but I tried it and it's not. It's miserable. It, it, it destroys your life. It, it robs you of all joy. There's no true gladness in it. You're only going to find gladness serving God. Serving the Lord with gladness, not serving yourself. But what the world tells you is that serving yourself is how you find gladness. That's how you get there. You serve yourself. Your own passions, your own lusts of your flesh. It's just all about, uh, you know, pleasing yourself. And there's a whole lot of that going on. And that is a sickness of sin, that is the blindness of Satan, and that is a veil that is on the eyes of every person that's lost. Is that I'll find happiness, I'll find joy, I'll find gladness in doing whatever I want to do and in serving myself. When in reality, and maybe it sounds counterintuitive, but, but gladness is not found in doing what you want to do, but it's in doing what Christ wants you to do. It's submitting your will to Him. Amen? And that is ultimately how we can find gladness in serving the Lord. And I, I want to I deal with one more verse. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> Colossians.
Colossians chapter 3. If you want to fall on, on service and being a servant of God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 22 says. <clears throat> Colossians 3 verse number 22 says. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. You and I would um, equate that to... Uh, in a boss man, right? Or you know, somebody, a, a supervisor. You have somebody over you at work. Your your own, um, you have your own business. Maybe it's the governmental agency. Who, whoever it is that 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 you serve. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Y'all see that again? This that common thread: fearing God and serving God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So we've seen, serve the Lord with fear. We've seen, serve the Lord with gladness. And in this verse, we have a wonderful illustration of the fact that, that we're not serving God for naught. There is a reward for serving God. There's a benefit. There's something you get in return. It's it, it, There's compensation for it. And I'm looking forward to that day when I get to see the rewards. Listen, you're going to receive rewards. Each of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, as the Bible calls it. And the Bible says that your works are going to be tried by fire, whether it be, it's either going to be found wood, hay, and stubble, it'll be found gold, silver, and precious stones. Listen, I'm going to have some wood, hay, and stubble there. I will have some wood, hay, and stubble. Hope to have some gold, silver, and precious stones too. We're probably all, there's probably all, there's probably things that we've done for the wrong reasons in the name of serving God. I'm sure we've all done that, right? That there are things that we had ulterior motives, we had our own uh, ends that we were attempting to accomplish and the things that we've done. But, 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 but what this verse is saying is that we serve the Lord uh, through, even through up serving other men. Say, when you, when you, you go to work tomorrow and, and, and you have your bosses, when you serve them, you're serving God. He says to serve them as unto the Lord. Submit to them as unto the Lord. Now, they're not the Lord. Everybody should say amen right there. You got one? You're, you're, listen, I, everybody I've worked for is not the Lord. They're not God. Most of them weren't even godly. They weren't even godlike. They weren't godlight. There was just nothing even close to God. Uh, 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 far on the other end. But even then, you're serving Christ. And that's the, the mentality that we should take out of these doors when we leave. In everything that we do, we're serving Christ. We're doing it for God. And that's why he says that whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Listen, I'm glad that I'm serving Christ. I'm glad to be a servant of Christ. And again, I, I think it is. it speaks volumes to James as an individual, that that's the, that's the title he decided to ascribe to himself. And I think we'd all do well to walk out of here proudly proclaiming that we're servants of Christ. Amen.